Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 532nd episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today we have Lee Sauls. He is the author of Sell Different, all new sales differentiation strategies to outsmart, outmaneuver, and outsell the competition. Um, good guy, good content. Um, as you can imagine, I get a lot of books mailed to me from a lot of PR firms, from um, salespeople coming out with new books. So um, I am always curious, you know, am I really going to learn something different? What's this guy's take? And, um, you know, we open right up with why are you different? Okay. How do you differentiate yourself? Why is selling hard today? We jump right in it. And uh, I think you'll like uh, some of the answers. Uh, it's a good book as well, but uh, just a straightforward talk as you've come to expect, know, appreciate, and love about the sales podcast. Uh, I haven't mentioned my book in a while, 79stories.info, 79stories.info. Sign now, well, sign now, order now, and get a signed copy. And they're in stock, okay? I will mail them out to you in time for Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, you name it. They're cheaper by the dozen, too, okay? Uh, I met with a, a friend of mine, and i um, going to be making some changes to some of the training programs. Um, so if you are interested, check out makeeverysale.com. That's the on-demand content. Um, based on our talks, we're probably going to brand everything under that, the on-demand, the group training, um, come out with uh, maybe a little short sprint, uh, something you could do in a focused um, effort in a shorter amount of time than have the ongoing uh, and then some private assistance as well. But uh, if you're looking for that, get it while you can. Make every sale.com and then stand by for the changes that are coming. But for now, let's bring on our guest, Lee. Lee Saul's three time author, author of the new Sell Different, all new sales differentiation strategies to outsmart, outmaneuver, and outsell the competition all the way from Minnesota. Welcome to the Sales Podcast, man. How the heck are you? I'm doing great, Wes. How are you? I'm good. But look, I'll ask the questions here, okay? Don't don't just jump right in and try to take <laughs> Sorry, over. it's your show. You ask the questions. <laughs> so look, man, I got to know, is that an LSU Tiger right there? Or is that some like Binghamton? What, what is that? L what's, what's the baseball shirt? Oh, this? This is uh, Concordia St. Paul University. My son pitches for them. Oh, very nice. And my older son plays baseball for Augsburg University. And then I see you, what, Notre Dame behind you? What's the eagle back there? No, that's actually UND, University of North Dakota, which is where my daughter, my daughter Oh, is. nice. All right. Hey. Yeah. As long as you've got reasons for all of them. I, I follow like three teams, right? Because I grew up in Baton Rouge and I played for Air Force, but I grew up oh, you in, did. Okay. In, you know, I, I went to junior high and high school in Houston. I went to grad school at A&M. So it's like, I wear like three hats, man. And they're like, you, you can't cheer for all of them. I'm like, the hell I can't. <laughs> Watch me. <laughs> so what's up, man? Sell different. So your first book on sales, at least, because your, your first one was was on hiring, right? Actually, I've had, this is sell difference number six. Oh, okay. Well, you got three on your LinkedIn. So very cool. I, I apologize for cutting you in half, man. And you only get half an interview. All right. Hey, that's why. <laughs> or we got to go twice as long. I got to, I got to plug you twice as hard now. So, but this one, so sales differentiation, now you're on sell different. Yes. Are, are you splitting hairs, man? Are you just trying to just sell more books? What the hell's going on? No, actually it's a very, very different book, right? That's the theme. But you know, Wes, you, I feel like you're putting me on the spot, right? We're, we're just talking here first few minutes. And you're asking me what's different about my new book. Is that really fair? I'm a sales whisperer. It's what I do. Oh, you know I just, that was like you a Joe Biden is, moment. It is fair. And salespeople <laughs> listening, whether your buyers ask you that point blank or not, that's the huge question that's on their minds every time they meet with you. Yep. They want to know what's different. Yep. And if you can't articulate it, if you can't demonstrate it, Wes, what wins the day? Price. Yeah. Amen. All right, so what's different about sell different? First of all, sales has never been tougher than it is today. Competition's fierce. The differences and features and functions become so narrow between providers, makes it so challenging for salespeople to differentiate what they're selling. And at the same time, and Wes, maybe you're seeing something different than I am, but I haven't seen any executive saying, hey, salespeople, 
I know it's tough out there. We're going to lower your quota by 50%. Go ahead, go ahead and sell the deal at 20 points lower. We're okay with that. Are you seeing anybody say that? I, I did, but they went out of business. Now, I don't still expecting salespeople to win at high rates while protecting margins, or as I just trademarked, win more deals at the prices you want. But how do you do that? How do you do that when what you're selling, the differences are so subtle, so narrow? How do you win deals at high rates and high margins when they're so narrow? Well, you need to sell different. And what that means is looking at every touch point in the buyer-seller relationship and identifying ways to outsmart, outmaneuver, and outsell the competition. And that's exactly what this new book does. I get into everything from how you generate leads and referrals, how you handle discovery meetings. You know, everybody wants to talk about improving closing ratios. Fix discovery and you'll take care of your closing ratios. How you sell virtually. You know, there wasn't a chapter, Wes, scheduled on virtual selling. And then this little thing happened. What's it called again? Oh, the pandemic, right. Now there's a chapter there on virtual selling best practices. How to deal with the ultimate deal killer, fear of change, and much, much more. So the focus of Sell Different is providing you with strategies and techniques to win more deals to prices you want during fiercely competitive times. And each one of the 15 chapters presents strategies that regardless of what you sell or to whom you sell, will help you win more deals at the prices you want with step-by-step -step instructions on how to implement each one. You know, that, that's another important difference between this book and most sales books. Wes, I'll give you a peek in the kitchen. First step of my editing process, I sent the manuscript to several of my clients. And I said, I'm not looking for you to mess with the spelling or, or the grammar. Here's <laughs> what I want to know. What could you not implement based on the way I presented it in the book? See, I wanted to make sure this book was structured in a way that you can implement every one of these strategies on your own. Wes, I'm sure you've had the experience that I have with so many sales books. They present content in such a complex way. It's almost like a teaser. You get intrigued by the content, but it's too difficult, too complex to understand and implement on your own. So you got to write a check. Not the case with Sell Different. Part of my promise is that you can read the book and implement everything that I've presented in it. That's good because I, I do get that pushback and it's, and it's realistic. I, I, mean, I worked in corporate America for years and I remember one time I, I thought I was doing a good thing. I realized late in life that I was a marketer trapped in a salesman's body. Okay. So I understand both, right? And I like both. I like, or maybe I'm just a lazy salesperson, right? I want to do <laughs> crap that's efficient, you know? And I'm like, right. man, marketing is important. And, and I, it was, I was in the tech space and, uh, you know, Perry Marshall? I do not. He, he was a, a technician and uh, he's up in the Chicago area, I think, but I, I've known of him for years, met him a couple of times, had him on the podcast. He is the antithesis of a salesperson, right? He's an engineer and he, but he was learning market. He learned the hard way, right? The importance of marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, great story. He's very analytical in how he goes about it. And he was selling this white paper course. So I bought it, you know, and then, and I, I, when I had him on the show, I told him, I still remember back then he he wasn't as famous as he is now or right? at least in the internet marketing circles mm -hmm. and so he gave you a one-hour consultation with the purchase man i was like fire i was in houston i was staying at my buddy's house from high school and i'm like <laughs> dude i gotta take this call you know but i told my company i was doing that and they got mad at me it's not your job that's marketing's job blah 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 right so so i learned to keep my mouth shut on the things that i was doing so, you know because a lot of times salespeople they they cannot implement, they need, like, they don't have their own blog. They don't, they can't change the logo, the card, their business card is set. They can't change the signature of their company. Everything's branded, yeah. you know? So it's, it's good to hear that, you know, you're giving them things they can do. And by the way, none of it conflicts with anything their manager is telling them to do. It doesn't conflict with any selling system that your company has in place. It's an enhancement. It's a layer on top. So can you give us a little sneak peek of one or two things that, that you cover? Sure. One of the things I get into is the buying experience. This is in chapter one. As a matter of fact, you can download chapter one for free at selldifferentbook.com. You can download the print or the audiobook version. But I talk a lot about the, the buying experience, and I share the story of when my son, Stephen, went through the baseball recruiting process. 
you know, he was a pretty good baseball player in high school and he had aspirations of, of playing in college. And during the period between his junior and senior year, he was asked to play on our American Legion baseball team. And I don't know if you're familiar with American Legion, but this is where all the college scouts come looking for talent. And Wes, during the course of one week, he hit four home runs and three doubles. All of a sudden, the conversation my wife and I were having, which was, Stephen, you got to start calling the colleges. You got to start reaching out. You got to schedule visits. All of a sudden, the whole conversation changed. Now the colleges were coming to us. And if you've been through a college recruiting experience before, you know it's a sale. These coaches are trying to sell you on their institution, but they can't differentiate what they're selling. Coaches can't add a major or build a dorm. They can't change the meal plan. They can't move the cafeteria. They're all fixed assets. What do they have to do? They have to sell different, meaning looking at the overall experience that they put people through, candidates and their families, so that they differentiate this themselves so that those families want to come to that institution rather than the alternative. Wes, you know when you first go to visit a college campus, as soon as you cross onto the border, your blood pressure jumps about 30 points. Oh, that man, they, they just handed us beer, and we just started partying, and then I signed. I didn't even realize I had committed. Well, no, I'm talking about in the recruiting process. When you first cross onto the campus, your blood pressure jumps. You know why? You can't find a place to park. Yeah. Every parking lot on a college campus says, Amen. park here, and we're going to tell you, but welcome to our fine institution. Right. This one school we visited, Wes, we pull into the parking lot, and there's a spot with Stephen's name on it. Stopped us dead in our tracks. Then we go inside. There's an agenda for the day printed. Stephen's name right at the top. What did it cost this university to do those two things? A penny, maybe for the paper and ink. But think about how they made us feel, right? They made us feel like Stephen was the only athlete they're recruiting anywhere on the planet for any sport they offered. Yep. Of course, that wasn't the case, but that's how they made us feel. Sure. See, in sales, we forget to make people feel special. For us, all day long, we're having calls, 10, 15, 20, 30 conversations about what we're selling all day long, every day, every week, every month, every year. So it becomes rote. What we forget is, while we're having these conversations all day long, they, meaning our prospects, are only having one with us. One. And we need to treat it as if that's the only conversation we're ever going to have about what we're selling. No one wants to feel like a number. And that's one of the old expressions in sales, right? Sales is a numbers game. And I only partially subscribe to that. I do believe there's quantifiable aspects that's important to, to manage to. But if you exclusively see it through the lens of a numbers game, you treat people like a number. Mm -hmm. And no one wants to be treated like a number. Yeah. As a matter of fact, there were seven schools recruiting Stephen. The one that was number one on his list, bags packed, this is where he's going, was number seven at the end of the process. Mm. They didn't get rid of a major, they didn't knock down a dorm, and they didn't change the meal plan. It was the recruiting experience. They said the words, Stephen, we want you here. But their actions didn't support it. They made him feel like a number. How bad was it? When Stephen's brother David went through the recruiting process, David was a nationally recognized pitcher. That school wasn't even on his list. Wow. Wouldn't even consider him because of the experience that his brother went through. So when you think about treating someone like a number, you're not just blowing that deal. They're going to tell other people. And now the overall brand of the company is in jeopardy because of the way you treat them. You don't make them feel special. You know, there's a, uh, there's a restaurant my wife and I go to, Steakhouse. And at that intersection, there are a number of restaurants where you could get a good steak. But we keep going back to the same restaurant, Wes. And guess what? It's the most expensive of all of them. And they're not perfect. They screw up a steak time every now and again. But you see, there's this waitress, Sarah. We always sit in Sarah's section. And Sarah <laughs> knows we're there for days. Sarah remembers what my favorite drink is, remembers my wife's favorite drink. She knows what I usually like to order, remembers what my wife likes to order. She creates an experience for us. And when the steak doesn't come out perfect, now I'm going to tell you something my, my doctors wouldn't like hearing, but I'll tell you this. I, I like drawn butter with a steak, you know, nice hot drawn butter to, to dunk in there. When the steak doesn't come out right, 
I never have to ask for a new carafe of drawn butter. She brings the steak out with a fresh carafe because she knows that's part of the dining experience. Why make me ask for it? You know it's now cold. Yeah. It's all about building the experience. So you we want to keep going back there, partially because of the restaurant, mostly because of Sarah. So for those of you in sales, as my good buddy Jeb Blunt says, people buy you and the value that you offer, that you represent, and the overall experience that you create for your clientele. Yeah. Long answer to your question, Wes. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. My daughter is, one of my daughters is Sarah, and she is a waitress paying her way through college. And <laughs> she was at a Mexican restaurant, which was right close to us, but now she's in San Diego State, so an hour away. So she was at BJ's and now she just got hired on a lazy dog at a, at a nicer area. So that's good news for her. But it's like, I, my wife does not like lemon. All right. She's weird. Okay. She's just, and you know, she doesn't listen to this podcast. So I can say that. And, and she's not in the house right now. So I can say it loud. My wife's weird. I love lemon. I like, lemon should go in iced tea. All right. So, you know, we'll order. We always get iced tea and uh, unsweetened. And she's like, no lemon. Like I'll take her lemon. Right. So they bring lemon. And then they come up to refill my glass, literally about one out of 50. Well, they bring more lemon. It's like once that thing is squeezed out and sinks down to the bottom of the glass, it's like, it's not really lemon anymore. They don't remember it. <laughs> but to your point, right? When somebody just remembers that, it's like, oh, your tip just went up. Absolutely. You know, because they pay attention to the little things. But how does this work in business? I mean, if I'm a, if I'm a, bag carrying quota guy i'm selling technology i'm calling on these big companies and you know they they do have choices they do uh, you know uh, i can take them to lunch i can take them to dinner you know but i'm only going to see them once a month maybe you know it's part of my territory making my rounds how do i make them feel special well here's the big overarching question that you need to ask yourself what is it that i can do different than my competition that my buyers will find meaningful. We need that word meaningful in there. It's not different for the sake of different. So look at every touch point, every interaction that you have from the first time you pick up the phone, the first time you send an email, all the way through and the way you handle customer service, the way you handle account management and every step in between. And ask yourself that question. For every sale type in every company, by asking yourself that question for every one of those interactions, the answers quickly expose themselves. It's not hard. We just need to care. Mm, I care. I care about my quota. If Am I misguided? You about, you're not hitting it. <laughs> Am I misguided? <laughs> Am I misdirected? Just a little bit. So, but what can I do, right? I, I'm, I'm dealing with, you know, a mid-level manager. He'll bring in the technician sometimes that actually use the equipment, but his boss and his boss's boss have to sign off on this thing. Let's talk about that circumstance because a lot of our listeners probably have that. We'd all love to talk to the end all be all decision maker. Oftentimes we're talking to the mid-level manager. Like I do a lot of work with the technology companies and they're talking to mid-level managers and those mid-level managers need to get others involved in, in this opportunity or the deal goes nowhere. And there's a step that I find so many salespeople miss with mid-level and upper management as well. We've been taught to probe for pain, right? So we come in and they start articulating these challenges that they're having, we're writing it down and we're salivating because like you said, Wes, we got to hit quota. Oh, they got this pain. They got this challenge. We're just writing it down. Oh yeah, we're getting this one. Mm. And it doesn't dawn on us to probe a level further and identify if this particular pain point that we've just learned about is a problem or an inconvenience. Is it a problem or an inconvenience? Those are not synonyms. And so often you'll find prospects will discuss areas that could be better, that are challenging for them. But the reality is they're inconveniences, meaning they're not ready to spend money or put resources to it or do anything about it. They'll complain about it, but they're not willing to do anything about it. And one of the reasons why so many salespeople have pipe dreams instead of pipelines is because they don't dig enough into those pain points to understand if what you're hearing is an inconvenience or a problem. We talk about solutions. Solutions don't go with inconveniences, right? They go with problems. 
I'll give you a, a personal example. I got a COVID puppy. She's now a year and a half. And she gets very excited when dogs walk by the house. And we had these nice wood blinds in the dining room. And just one day the blinds were down and she heard some dog walking by and she completely trashed the blinds. Like you can't fix them. They're done. So I can't tell you for how long my wife and I have been saying, yeah, we got to get new blinds for the dining room. Why? It's ugly. We, there's actually three windows. So two windows have blinds. One window is now covered with a sheet. How's that for attractive? But we haven't done anything about it yet. And if you would ask me, yeah, I, it, it's ugly. It's nasty. Your, your wife is not related to my wife. She'd have fixed that right away and I'd have paid for it. I'll tell you <laughs> what. We got family coming to town for Thanksgiving. Uh, I will guarantee you there will not be a sheet on that window. Uh, that inconvenience then becomes a problem, right? And yeah. that's one of the things that we have to delve further into. And now let's let's come back to your point about that mid-level manager. A lot of times, mid-level managers will clearly be able to articulate the pain that they have, and it's a problem. Remember I said, though, those mid-level managers need to get others involved. They all have to turn their keys if this deal is going to have any legs to it. And we don't ask that mid-level manager about those north on the York chart and ask them a very direct question. I understand what you're telling me and all the challenges and, and, and how this impacts you. But for those that you have to get involved for this to move ahead, do they see this as a problem or an inconvenience? We can ask them that about how others perceive it. Do they perceive this as a problem or an inconvenience? Whoa, whoa, whoa. We just simply ask? Yeah. Wait, a, wait a minute. No, I, It's some, okay. It's okay. Some, we can ask questions. I need some NLP. I got to take off my Apple watch and like, <laughs> I got to, I got to get, you're getting very sleepy. I mean, come on, man. I got, come on. I'm telling you, if you're talking with a mid-level manager who's all fired up saying, we've got to do something about this call center. It doesn't, this help desk, it doesn't work right. You know, we've got software issues. We have staffing issues on and on and on. People are waiting for an hour to get someone to, to satisfy their, their issue and resolve it. And they're so passionate about it, but they've got to get the CIO to sign off on it. Say, I'm just curious. From what you've described, does that CIO see what you've described as an inconvenience or a problem? And you know what response you're going to get more often than not, Wes? Well, I'm... You just gave say, it. Silence. Yeah, I would say some probably don't know. They're actually going to be quiet because they're going to really, for the first time, start thinking about it. Right. And they say, you know, I don't know how they see it. Well, this deal goes nowhere unless the others north on the York chart see it through the same lens as this mid-level manager. So we've got to coach them and how to have those conversations. So in this case, the CIO sees it through the same lens that it's a problem, meaning we need to put time, resources, and dollars to address it. Yeah, I would imagine if, if it was a real problem, the higher level people are probably gonna get involved earlier in the conversation if it was truly the house is burning down. Well, I'll give you an example. I, I talked about this for a help desk. I have a client I do a lot of strategy work with, and they sell outsourced help desk. And so often the salespeople will tell me, I mean, and they'll be really irritated on the client's behalf. You know, God, the wait times are just so long and, and it's killing productivity and on and on and on. And, and I say, okay, so tell me about this mid-level manager. And they'll say, yeah, it's really frustrating because all things that they can't put a dollar amount to right? So they're just describing these hardships. And then when they ask the question about North on the York chart, they do, they get silence and they, they have to think about it. And they go, you know, I think they see it as an inconvenience. Okay. Red lights flashing. If we don't do something to help those executives see it through the same lens, go home. Deal's not happening. So that's our opportunity. When you have that mid-level manager who's so passionate saying, We've got to do something about it. They see it through the lens of a problem. But North on the org chart sees it as an inconvenience. We've got to coach them and help them work with that executive so they see it the same way. If not, go home. Deal's not happening. So this brings up another point. You know, where should we be calling into a big company? You know, we've got this complex sale, right? Yep. Multiple people multiple meetings over an extended period of time. 
-hmm. You know, some say I only call the top, I only talk to C level executives, you know, and others are like, I go to the technician and I get their buy in and, you know, bottom up. And, you know, where, where should I start on a new account? I would look at what your meaningful differentiators are and ask yourself who will see that meaningful value at the greatest level in the organization? Because that's where I want to start the conversation and get them really excited and then work with that individual. So it could be the most senior level person. It could be a mid-level manager. But where my differentiators are going to resonate most is where I want to enter that organization. Because I want to get somebody, I refer to this entity called a mentor, someone who's super excited about the solutions that we represent. Now, a mentor is not a coach. A mentor is a very specific defined entity that has two criteria. One is their level of commitment to your solution being the one that's selected. And the other is level of influence in the decision-making process. And you rank in those two categories, zero to five. So if I can take someone, a mid-level manager, get them all fired up about this opportunity that we represent, our solution, to where I get them to a five, maybe their level of influence isn't that high. Maybe they're only a three of level of influence, but I can channel that energy that they have for our solution and help them sell internally so that our solution is the one that's selected. So is that, I mean, because I've heard of, you know, advocates or coaches or internal champions, yep. some kind of the same concept. No, because to me, those are, there's no definition. You know, a coach, someone, you know, they'll kind of help you out. This is a very specific criteria. There's a chapter in Sell Different about this. When we, everyone we meet in an account, we're going to put through this filter where we're evaluating them on this mentor scale. Their level of commitment to our solution being the one that's selected and their level of influence in the decision-making process, zero to five on both scales. In a perfect world, we'd have someone that's a 10. But more often than not, we have a 10 for one main reason, which is we're not being honest with ourselves. We th we're believing when someone says, oh, it's just a rubber stamp. I just tell them what to do and they'll sign the check. We usually have numbers less than 10. What that tells us is that there's vulnerabilities in the deal. Anytime we have a score less than five in either of those two categories, there's vulnerabilities in the deal. Well, if we have vulnerabilities around their level of commitment to our solution being the one that's selected, there's a couple of areas for us to look at. One is if this person has the, the ability to get excited about what we sell, then the burden's on us to position our differentiators in a meaningful way to get them up to a five. But if they're in a role, this is back to your question, Wes, if they're in a role that is not going to get excited about, let's say you sell something around compliance, that's your main story, and you're meeting with an ops person who doesn't get excited about compliance, well, they're never going to get very high on that level of commitment scale because that's not where they're passionate. So I want to work with someone that can get really excited about our meaningful differentiators. It would be great if they're also heavily influential in the deal, but I can work with that if I can get started with them being passionate about what we bring to the table. Very cool. I like that because it's I don't I don't like vagaries. You know, when, when you say a coach or a champion, that's not helpful to me. Because then when I think of a coach or a champion, now I've got to consider their personality. Are they really nice? In my mentor scale, I don't care if they're nice or a curmudgeon. I care about how passionate they are about our solution being the one that's selected. And I care about how influential they are in the decision-making process. This individual may be a curmudgeon, someone that just is not a friendly person, but they understand our value. They see it, they get it, and they can help drive this home. They're a strong mentor for me. Yeah. So when I think of coach or champion, I find salespeople get confused because someone's really nice, but they can't do anything about it. Yeah. They're fundamentally nice people. What I care about is their level of commitment to my solution being the one that's selected and their level of influence in making the deal happen. I guess that the one caveat could be like, I, I got a lot of info from like executive assistants and, Sure. I guess arguably they have some influence, right? But like, I, I, I would know, I would know if the boss was in a good mood, like how things are going with the company for the quarter. Um, so I was at least nice to them, right? I, I didn't have to, I guess I sold them a little bit, but really like just by not ignoring them, they were just appreciative. <laughs> That's the worst thing you can do with a gatekeeper. 
right? You make them feel like your sole purpose in life is to get around them. Right. Just like no one wants to be treated like a number. No one wants to feel like your purpose is to get around them. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people make that mistake, but I'm glad because it, it made my job so much easier and, <laughs> and lucrative. All right. So you mentioned chapter one and what else? was it? Chapter 15. You mentioned there's 15 chapters, right? So you mentioned one. So, all right, I hold on. I'm flipping. Let's see. What is this chapter? Making your sales life easier and more lucrative. Chapter four. Tell me about it. What do we need to know? I was expecting there to be a quiz. Yeah, you know, sales, you know, salespeople, we, we talk about how hard sales is, but there's so much low-hanging fruit that we don't take advantage of. Unless you just hung out a shingle and started your business, you have clients, probably lots of them. And we forget that there is an opportunity to leverage what we already have. Sure, you think of upselling and you think of cross-selling and you probably think of referrals, but there's another really helpful aspect that they provide that so many salespeople don't use. Heck, company institutions don't use it either. And that is this. If we think about who our best client is and say, boy, I'd like to take my best clients and stick them in a copier as a way to grow the business. Of course, we can't do that. But there's a strategy that will help us with that, where we identify those best clients. Notice, Wes, I didn't say our largest clients because those aren't synonymous, right. right? A lot of times your biggest clients are low margin, complex solution, you're not looking to replicate. I want the clients that if I could stick them in a copier, I'd do it in a heartbeat. And I'm going to have a conversation with each one of them. I'm not upselling, I'm not cross-selling, I'm not asking them to be a reference, I'm not asking for referrals. I'm going to have a very simple conversation and it's not going to be an email. It's not going to be a text. It's actually going to be either in person or on the phone. And I'm going to ask them one question. Wes, you've been working with us for a long time. So you're familiar with what we offer and the quality of what we offer. If you were me, what associations would you be active in? What conferences would you attend? What events would you go to? What would you be reading to meet more people like you? It's an open book test. <laughs> we ask those clients and you will be amazed. See, here's the way people work. They fundamentally want to help. But if you don't ask them, they're not just going to stick their neck out and say, well, let me tell you what you should do. A small percentage of the population would do that. But most people, without being asked, won't do it. So what we're going to do is ask them to take our hat, place it on their heads for a moment and provide us with their counsel. And that end part to meet more people like you strokes their ego. So it further invites them to provide their counsel. Mm -hmm. And Wes, this is a strategy. We were talking baseball before. I'm batting a thousand. I put this in place with sales teams that I manage, client organizations, and never once have we come away empty handed. Never mm -hmm. once. And by the way, what does it cost you to put this into practice? Zero. Zero. And I, I can share a couple of great stories. I had this one group and we said, hey, uh, let's have 10 of these if you were me conversations over two weeks. And about five minutes before we were supposed to jump on a call, I get an email from the sales manager and the subject is an apology. He says, hey, we got really busy over the last two weeks. We only got to have four of these conversations. So we should probably postpone our call today. But I attached our findings. West four pages of them from four conversations four pages of finance and what are you apologizing for this is pure gold <laughs> then i had another one uh coaching client had 10 of these conversations over two weeks he also didn't get to 10 but he had a 45 minute update for me about everything he learned during these conversations he found out about a technology council in his own backyard. He had been prospecting, trying to get to these executives and wasn't able to get to a single one of them right in his own backyard. And his client says, by the way, I can bring you as my guest if you'd like. Not only did he go as, as a guest, a few months ago, he had a chance to present at that organization. Folks he was prospecting into, unable to reach and- walked, Led right in. Walked right in. Now, one of these, if you were me conversations, he did it in person with his CEO sitting next to him. The CEO didn't know about the strategy. That evening, I get an email from the CEO saying, oh my gosh, I watched it in action today. 
nearly cried. This is what I've been missing my entire sales life. This strategy works. So Wes, remember I said at the beginning, every one of these chapters is designed for you to be able to implement it on your own. It doesn't conflict with any sales methodology that you have or any directive from your management team. Perfect example of it. Yeah, that's awesome. So where do they go? You told us at the beginning, where do you want them to go to get this book? You can buy it wherever you'd like. It's available in all the brick and mortar stores. You can go to Amazon. It's available in hardcover, Kindle, and audiobook. Wherever you buy it, visit selldifferentbook.com, selldifferentbook.com. First of all, if you want to get a sample, you can read the first chapter or listen to the first chapter right off that page. And when you do purchase it, go back to selldifferentbook.com. There's a video series. For 52 weeks, that's a full calendar year, every week for a year, you're going to get an email from me with a link to a video to help you implement the strategies that you've read about, plus other things that aren't even in the book. All right. I am linking there and I've got it here. So I appreciate it. I'm glad you made some time. I we had to reschedule. So how's the book launch going? It's, it's good. I take it's it. Amazing. It's been amazing. We hit Number one in the U.S. and Canada, and it's been the top new sales book in most countries around the world. Very nice. And you come on here and share that wisdom for free on the sales podcast, man. <laughs> it's like Christmas in October. Only for you, Wes. Only for you. <laughs> it's Christmas in October, baby. Very nice. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate you carving out the time. Thank you. This was a blast. All right, everybody. You heard it here first. Let's go get the book. Lee, thanks for coming on, man. Have a great thanks, day. Wes. The buying experience matters. Who would have thunk it, huh? So uh, I'm recording this outro. Just got back from dinner. My seven-year-old daughter had uh, her first ballet recital. It was actually pretty good. And uh, we went to dinner. And um, favorite little Mexican food um, chain out here. Started where my uh, wife grew up in Corona. They've expanded all over uh, this area, and um, I love it. Simple, uh, chicken burrito, original. That's my jam. But we get there, and uh, my mother-in-law sits down, and she's legally blind. Um, so, you know, she, she gets around on her own, but she doesn't see too good, as you might imagine. And she sits at a table, and it's just filthy. Uh, just, you know, rice and, and refried beans just all over the table on the seats. And um, I go get a guy. Hey, can you come clean this? Right. And the dude was cool, apologetic, came right over or he sent somebody over and he had this wet rag. And I mean, he wiped in a hurry. He had some uh, oomph, but um, it was a soaking wet rag. And he's literally like he's just wiping it on the floor, but wiping it onto me. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just watching. I'm like, oh, OK, whatever. Doesn't wipe down the bench. Uh, we left open. And um, so he leaves. I go to the men's room to get some just some paper towels. They're out of paper towels. My wife's in the restroom with our daughter. So I yell into there and they're the only ones there. So I go in and get some hand towels and go and dry off our table, you know. So, um, but hey, this was, uh, you know, $15 dinner. So I guess I can't complain, Right. And we know these people, we love the food, and we know these are some crazy times. Uh, at least these kids were working, right? And they were pretty well staffed. But if somebody's buying something that's high dollar, if somebody's buying something that's very competitive, uh, and, you know, and, and these folks are in the same, same shopping center, right? they share the parking lot with In-N-Out. In-N-Out always has 10, 12, 15 cars or more in the drive through and the parking lot's full. This other place, you know, not so busy. So maybe that buying experience matters. Um, in and out isn't dirty like that. So, you know, consider that. Take a step back and say, how are you differentiating yourself on how people buy? If you listen to this much at all, you've heard me talk about, you know, to make any sale, you must make every sale. So every step along the way, every interaction is a little baby close. It's a little miniature sale. So have you taken the time? I 
personally, you know, got a little complacent. So I'm bringing in some fresh eyes, you know, to look at this. I mean, I know this one guy. I've known him for years. I've used him for uh, his VA services, and he's brought in a new partner. They've created a new division, and I don't know her from Adam. So, and she doesn't know me. So she was hitting me with some hard questions, and um, it's worth it, right? Get uncomfortable if you want to grow. So I'm not telling you all to do anything I haven't done a hundred times and I'm going to do a hundred more times and I'm doing right now. Okay. So, um, you know, Lee gets into some good stuff. I'm linking to his book, uh, through the website. They'll pay me a few nickels. Uh, we mentioned Jeb Blunt. I've had Jeb on a couple of times. Um, you can check out his most recent one, episode 441. Um, we get into right after COVID started. So it was a good interview. We were talking about working the phones and, um, how to get after it when, you know, the times are tough, when they're changing and, you know, it's always going to happen. So that's a good one to check out 441. All right. I mentioned my book, 79stories.info. Get you a signed copy and I'll uh, get a few, make a great stocking stuffer. Okay. And then as the holidays approach, you have some downtime. You want to go through some great sales content, order yourself the make every sale program, make every sale dot com 41 videos a whole lot of handouts uh, i share a lot of good tips i mean some of my best secrets uh, are in that program that um i guarantee will help you sell more faster at higher margin with less stress and more fun i guarantee thanks for listening now go sell something <laughs>